We're on our way to Sullivan Correctional Facility, New York State, to meet one of America's most notorious living serial killers. Six o'clock, got in the car, drove 280 miles to a really weird meeting. Most terrifying are the bare statistics. In 1972, Shawcross killed two children. He served 15 years in prison. Within a year of his release, he was killing again, this time prostitutes. He murdered 11 within 18 months, the last two on the same night. Frightened that, you know, what's he got to lose? He could just, in the interview, stretch over and grab my neck or... I don't see what there is to stop him doing that. He's in there for 230 years or whatever. It doesn't make much difference. Um, can I call you Arthur? Is that call right? me anything you want. Yeah, all right. Just late for dinner. My brother's called Arthur. Shawcross parades himself as the real Hannibal Lecter, the baddest of the bad. You know, you're in here now for how long? I got 10 years, five months in, and I got 239 years, seven months to go, right? Shawcross claims he ate the vaginas of three of his prostitute victims. Can you tell me about what cannibalism occurred with your victims, your prostitute victims? Ah, uh, repeat it. Did you cannibalize? Any of your prostitute victims? Mm, three. What happened? What did I do? Mm. <laughs> That's hard to talk about, lady. Well, I uh, cut parts of the body out. One part. Vagina and uh, consumed that. Why? I don't know. There is disagreement on whether Shawcross's claims of cannibalism are true or a weird form of bravado. Autopsies showed mutilation in the genital area but the bodies retrieved from the river were so decomposed that the evidence on cannibalism is inconclusive. Either way, it's become part of the legend Shawcross has created. On the internet, he has his own website devoted to everything from his taste in poetry to his taste in flesh. Dr. Jonathan Pincus is the most recent psychiatrist to question Shawcross about his cannibalism. I'm not sure why someone would claim to do that if it hadn't done it. And now whether it occurred as often as it, he says it did, whether it occurred at all, it's obviously something that gives him satisfaction to talk about and to think about and to pose about. Let's say he didn't do it. Let's say he, he's just fantasizing about the whole thing or lying about it. Uh, it. It really doesn't matter. Obviously, he wants people to think that he was a cannibal and he ate these victims. It represents his mastery uh, over these women whom he killed. His complete control it makes him seem important and, and, and uh, unusual and, uh, I, I guess, in his own mind, um, competent. Shawcross was born to a U.S. Marine and a teenage mother in 1945. He claimed at his trial that his life was blighted from the outset. Under hypnosis, he said he was an abused child, that his mother had forced him to perform oral sex on her. Can you describe what happened to you as a kid? My mother, when I was four, introduced me to something I don't want to talk about in front of you as a female, you know, really. It's okay. Honestly, that's what I said before, that... Yeah, well... 
If you can, I'd like you to be frank. She had me put my head between her legs. And that's hard to talk about. Shawcross's mother rejects these claims and no evidence has ever been produced to support them. Psychiatrists can only confirm that severe disruption of the maternal bond can lead to antisocial behavior. By 18, Shawcross had become a petty criminal with burglary and arson convictions. At 23, he went to Vietnam. He claims it was there he first discovered a taste for human flesh. He says he tracked two Viet Cong women in the jungle, ambushed them, and tied one to a tree alive while he cut up and cooked the other. And I took the leg, the right leg from that woman's body, from the knee to the hip, took the skin off, took the cords out, and took the fat off. And it was only about that big around anyway. And I had crushed rock salt in my one of my ammo pouches, and I sprinkled the water on it, and I'm staring at this other girl, because I don't know if she speaks English or whatever, or broken English, and I'm putting the rock salt on it, and I'm sitting there cooking over a fire, you know, and when I bit into it, looking at, staring this other girl in the eye, she just urinated right there, you know. So what did it taste of? When's the last time you had a nice roast pork? A while ago. I don't think you're going to eat it again, are you? If you take a, a fresh ham for a roast pork and it's the butt end where it's a little burnt, that's what you taste like. And why did you, why did you eat it? I have no idea. Were you hungry? No. If the Vietnam story sounds like fantasy, what is beyond doubt is that in 1972, now living in New York State, Shawcross committed his first recorded murders. He killed an eight-year-old girl and a boy of 11, Jack Blake. He later told a psychiatrist he ate the boy's penis. That I won't talk about. Why is that? Because I won't talk about it. It's just that, you see, we're trying to make this film about, about cannibalism to understand. But that has nothing to do with that uh, section of my life in Watertown, New York. Is that what you're referring to? Um, I'm referring to Jack, Jack Blake. I have no idea. That I don't even talk about. Is that because you feel... Like I said, I won't talk okay, about it. Okay. Mum's word. Shawcross's reticence may be sheer cunning. To admit paedophilia brings only loathing, but to be a cannibal killer of prostitutes makes him infamous. Talking about eating human flesh presents no problem. It doesn't bother you at all. No. I think about a lot of things, but for some reason, I don't have a conscience. I don't have remorse for anything. After Shawcross's arrest in early 1990, psychiatrist Richard Krauss was commissioned by the defense to carry out tests on Shawcross's mental and physical state. The results were remarkable. Specifically, I found three major areas of, of, uh, of impairment. Uh, number one, genetically he's abnormal. Um, something in the order of, I think, uh, one in a thousand male births will be an XYY. Uh, in prison, uh, you will find them uh, in the order of 10 to 20 per thousand. Secondly, he has very high levels of a, a chemical called cryptopyrrole. Cryptopyrrole is a chemical produced in the liver from an abnormal breakdown of red blood cells. If it appears in the bloodstream, it is normally excreted in urine. It has similarities with the drug LSD, 
and impairs the functioning of the brain. Arthur Shawcross turned out to have four times the average amount. When these cryptopyrols are very elevated, it is directly associated with a great deal of emotional instability um, and depression and moodiness uh, and, and a host of other symptoms and behavioral changes, including violence, including violence. And, and this seemed to be, to me, the second key in beginning to move towards an explanation of Arthur Shawcross. When I was 18, I got hit here by a sledgehammer. And then on top of that, <clears throat> he had uh, clearly demonstrated brain damage to the frontal parts of his brain from injuries that he'd sustained over the years. And he was knocked out and had to be taken to the hospital. Now, that sounds like significant head injury to me. And um, he's got the scars to, to prove it. This one here, where the guy hit with a discus in high school. And where's the other one from and the sledgehammer? This indentation right here is where he hit with a sledgehammer. Yeah, I can feel it. Four different types of brain imaging confirmed that the two severe blows left permanent scars on Shawcross's frontal lobe, which contains the prefrontal cortex. In the cases of Shawcross, Sagawa, Chikatilo, the common denominator in all three of these cases is frontal lobe abnormality. When we get completely outrageous, bizarre behavior like cutting people up, eating their flesh. It's not surprising to find in these cases that there is frontal lobe abnormalities. My okay. okay. Thank you very much. Free adoption. No. Why are you shaking? <laughs> Good one, Art. <laughs> Physical brain damage may help explain why Shawcross, Sagawa and Chikatilo became killers. At this time in America, Adrian Rain, a neuroscientist, was researching frontal brain abnormalities in violent offenders. The prefrontal cortex sits right above your eyes and just behind your forehead. In animals, only three or four percent of the brain consists of prefrontal cortex. In the human brain, it's 29 percent. The prefrontal cortex of the brain is a bit like the guardian angel on our behavior. It's really what makes us human and allows us to live and function in human societies without being aggressive. It stops us doing antisocial, aggressive, outrageous acts. We've always had the idea that perhaps damage to the frontal region of the brain may be involved in violent offending and in creating the psychopathic-like personality. Neurologically, the prefrontal cortex acts as a controlling mechanism for the basic human emotions of anger and aggression, which emit from the limbic system further back in the brain. In the early 90s, Adrian Rain did a series of brain scans on a group of 41 murderers in Californian prisons and compared them with normal people. The cool colors indicate poor brain function and the warm colors indicate good brain function. You will see in this brain scan of the normal individual that the very top of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, is highly activated. Now when we turn to the brain scan of the impulsive murderer, you'll see a distinct lack of activation in the prefrontal cortex. So we believe that there is something fundamentally wrong with their physiological, emotional circuitry, and that at a basic level, there are brain deficits, which in some ways account for the malfunction in the emotional circuitry in violent murderers and cannibals.